Hey, what's up YouTube? Chris Sider here, founder of Ex-Boyfriend Recovery, and today I'm going to be teaching you about six signs to look out for to tell you if your ex is gone. Now, if you're anything like me, you probably want the answer to that question as soon as possible. If that's you, don't worry, I've got you covered. If you look in the description link below this YouTube video, there's actually a link there that's going to link you up to a quiz that if you take the quiz, it's going to tell you what kind of chance you have of getting your ex back. The quiz should only take you about two minutes and it's a great way to figure out if your ex is gone pretty much the fastest way possible. So again, if you're interested in taking this quiz and figuring out what kind of chance you have of getting your ex back, simply look in the description link below, click on the link you see there. It's going to take you to a page that will ask you questions about you, your ex, and your relationship together. And then based on how you answer those questions, we're actually going to run it through an advanced algorithm and it's going to spit out a score so that you can figure out kind of where you stand with your ex. So again, if you're interested in taking that quiz, simply look in the description link below the video and we're gonna hook you up. All right, let's begin. So is your ex gone for good? Well, today we're gonna to be talking about six signs to really keep an eye out for. But more specifically, I wanna to talk to you about really what I think you're trying to ask here if you're on this video and wondering if your ex is gone for good. Ultimately, there's no way for me or for you to know that because the only person who would know that is your ex. So what I'm gonna do instead is answer this question. In my opinion, the real question is what situations lower your chance of success with getting your ex back? That should tell you how much your ex is gonna be gone for, right? And overall, I found six situations lower your chances of success pretty significantly. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about each one of those situations, starting with situation number one, which is pretty self-explanatory, that's cheating. Now, the thing you have to understand about cheating or breakups in general is that when you're thinking, when you're looking about at getting someone back, a lot of people think that it's simply a process of doing doing a certain strategy or uh, implementing a certain tactic um, or saying the right thing, but that's actually not true. Ultimately, it boils down to what happens when your ex is left alone to his or her own devices. What are the thoughts that they're thinking, right? You do not want them to encounter any kind of significant headwind or ways to talk themselves out of trying to be with you. And cheating is a situation that really does that. It's a huge breach of trust and it can cause them to have the following type of thoughts. You know, I, I can't stop thinking of them with that other person. It's, it's absolutely killing me. Can I forgive them for this? I, I don't know. I'm so hurt. Those are examples of an internal conversation happening in your ex's head, right? A lot of people come up to me and say, Chris, I cheated on my ex. Is it possible for me to get them back? And the answer I give them is, yeah, it's possible. It's not impossible. But what you have to understand is you're going to have to get past this type of thinking where they're just obsessing time and time again about how they were wronged. And as a result, it's easier for them to walk away when they're having these constant thoughts. Uh, it's almost like they're self-fulfilling this prophecy of, you know, they want to stop thinking about you, but they can't stop thinking about how wronged they were. This makes it extremely difficult to move forward and have success with getting your ex back. Now, the second situation is kind of interesting. That's where you have non-responsive exes. Now, I'm going to tell you kind of a story. It may seem unrelated, but I promise you it is related. Um, when I was in college, I had a crush on a girl who sat next to me, right? And she sat next to me and over, over the few months, I was scared to talk to her, but eventually I worked up the courage and asked her for her number. And she said, sure. So we got the numbers, we exchanged numbers, and I'm thinking, man, I can't believe I got this beautiful girl's number. I am going to try to get a date with her, right? So we talked back and forth, got to know each other a little bit, and then I started to notice she got a little unresponsive, especially when it came to me asking her out on a date, right? I would say like, hey, I was thinking we should go out to dinner tomorrow. And she'd give me something kind of non-committal, non-responsive, and sort of said something like, ah, I'm actually kind of busy. And then, of course, me trying to play it off like I'm not bothered, I go, oh, no problem. When will you be available? And she just basically said, I don't just know yet. And then I say, let me know. 
And then the conversation ends there. And that was pretty much all of our conversations. Eventually, I got the hint. She's trying to ignore me. She's trying to sort of slowly distance herself from me. She's not interested. I never found out why she wasn't interested, but I've had a lot of time to think about it and understand it. And ultimately, what I think it it had to do with is she, there was no spark there. There was no excitement on her part to want to agree to go out to a dinner. And what I think a lot of people are like now is they don't like confrontation. So rather than hurting my feelings and saying like, look, you seem like a nice guy, but I'm never, ever going to look at you that way. She decides to be non-committal or non-responsive, giving me short and uh, non-substance texts or one-word texts or no texts and kind of let me get the hint. And I think a lot of people are like that. Now, we don't like confrontation, so oftentimes what you'll find people will do is slowly try to phase you out. Not necessarily ghost you, but be non-responsive and just send you a lot of text messages or give you a lot of answers that are kind of lacking in substance. And if you see that happening with your ex, it doesn't necessarily mean you're gone for good. Uh, Kind of the common theme that you're going to see throughout all of the situations I'm about to encounter for you is that uh, none of these necessarily mean that your ex is gone for good. It just means that these are going to negatively impact your chances going forward. So that's uh, situation number two. Situation number three is long distance relationships. Now, this is kind of interesting because this is a situation that uh, some people just don't have a lot of control over. And really what you need to understand about long distance relationships uh, before I get into why I think it's uh, a much more of a difficult situation than average and why when I look at our successes, why we only have a few long distance relationship successes, which tells me, okay, this is a, this is the hardest situation to be in is you need to understand what I like to call the window of opportunity theory or the triangle theory, right? So oftentimes when people ask me like, Hey, Chris, when will my chances be the best possible time to get my ex back, I kind of say, well, it kind of looks like a triangle. It creates this weird, funky looking triangle um, where when you first go through a breakup, uh, your chances are going to be low. They just are. Uh, but if you do the right things and you're you're significant about how you approach this uh, situation going forward or the, this process going forward and you actually make the right moves, you might find your overall chances start to to raise and then eventually over time, they'll plateau. And then after that plateau, they will inevitably go down. That's just the way this works. Now, I think um, a lot of people, we need to be trying to get our exes back right here, right at the peak of this process. That means when you need to be making the significant moves, you need to be seeing your ex in person, you need to be saying the right things to your ex, you need to be building up that anticipation of that in-person interaction, and long-distance relationships really skate against this. Because it forces us to rush everything and try to fit a bunch of long distance relationships, seeing each other in person type things all at once when they should be really spread out, when there should be a little bit more anticipation. Long distance relationships make this chart not necessarily impossible, but extremely difficult, right? So a lot of times you're not going to be Uh, at your peak when you're making your significant moves. You'll be maybe on the downward uh, end, or maybe you you haven't even gotten enough time together to build up to that peak. And that's why I think long-distance relationships become difficult to to handle and why that kind of situation has a lower chance of success. The fourth situation is what I like to call the full out block. Now, we've all been blocked at one time of our lives for being the creepy person, at least I have, um, or I've blocked people who've been creepy. But what a lot of people don't realize is that, in my opinion, there are three types of blocks or three types of ways of being blocked, right? The first way is something I like to call the shifty block. And the one common trend you'll notice is as we go down the chart, the blocks get worse, right? So the shifty block is where your ex blocks you and then suddenly unblocks you. So you see this a lot with exes who make impulsive decisions on Facebook where they decide to block you on Facebook and then a few days later unblock you to check out what you are only to block you again. And it kind of goes back and forth like a, like a seesaw. Um, uh, inevitably, I, I think shifty blockers are the most common type of people who block um, out of a breakup that I've seen. Then, of course, you have people who are partial blockers. This is where you're permanently 
permanently blocked almost everywhere, but there's a few avenues of communication open. So maybe they got you blocked on your social media profiles. Maybe they have you blocked or unfriended or what have you on Snapchat, on Facebook, on Twitter. I don't know if you really use Twitter or what have you, but uh, you, you can still talk to them via text or on the phone or something like that. That's what I call a partial block. A lot of times partial blockers are people who uh, just cannot stand seeing your face on social media anymore because it, it triggers them and they, they don't want to get triggered. Uh, whether they're triggered by being sad or angry, what what have you, it doesn't really matter. That's ultimately the motivation behind it. And then you have what I like to call the full out block. This is where you blocked, where you are blocked everywhere imaginable. This is where you have no way of communicating with them. This, in my opinion, is the very worst situation to be in. Now, there are a few ways out of it, but those ways are very limited, right? Because oftentimes you've done something to warrant the block, especially a full out block where they've blocked you everywhere and imaginable. They feel like you're such an unstable force that it's almost dangerous to allow you to talk to them. Of course, your situation will be, uh, your, your chances of success will be significantly lowered if you're in a full out block. Now, I don't want to get into talking about what you can do to get out of a full out block uh, because I've actually made videos and articles on that um, in which now that I think about it, I should probably update those so that um, because this is a hot topic, but just know that if you're in a full out block, your chances of success will lessen. That's just common sense. Situation number five is big age gaps. This is kind of uh, maybe a little bit out of left field there, but um, a few months ago, I, I created a video for the YouTube channel called The 11 Factors of Love. Basically, I was looking at what scientists detailed as the 11 most important factors for making someone fall in love with you. And the fifth factor of love was something called social influence. Um so what do I mean by that? Well, social influence is how other people perceive you and communicate with you about your relationship, right? So uh, this really relates to something I like to call the sphere of influence. Now, the sphere of influence is basically uh, the amount of people or the types of people that you surround yourself with that can affect your decision-making processes when it comes to your relationship. So these can be people like friends, family, work colleagues, sometimes heroes, Um Basically, uh, what I found to be true, though, is interesting enough, when you're in a situation where you have big age gaps, sometimes your sphere of influence will rebel against that and start putting these ideas in your head or putting these ideas in your ex's head so that they're freaked out and think like, wow, that is a big age gap. That's not normal. That's abnormal. And it can cause them to create that internal dialogue where they're thinking, yeah, you know, I have these feelings for them. But we have a 15-year age gap or what have you. Um, And this is one of the primary reasons for why I think people with big age gaps tend to not last as long as people who are a little bit closer in age. Probably because the social influence is giving your relationship this negative vibes and these negative vibes kind of push you apart. So that's situation number five. Situation number six is that you've been broken up for longer than eight months. You remember a few uh, slides ago, I was talking about this triangle theory or this um, window of opportunity theory. Well, and I talked about, okay, well, there's kind of this peak moment, this this peak moment in time where you're going to want to strike. This is where your chances are going to be the best they possibly will be. When does that occur? But when I actually did research and looked at my success stories, I found that this window of opportunity really occurred around three to seven months after the breakup. So that means you broke up and then three to seven months later, you peak. Now, this depends on a lot of different factors, mostly what you've done to get to that that window of opportunity or get to that peak in your chances. But it makes sense if you're looking at the average and it's around three to seven months, then probably around month eight, your chances start to lessen. Right? And it makes sense logically. Uh, the longer or more removed you are from the breakup, the more likely you are to move on. Right, So if you're waiting a, a very long time, it's easier for your ex to simply move on. It takes uh, a human being on average 66 days to form or even break a habit. Right, So eight months is much significantly longer than two months, which would be around 66 days. Uh, a little under it, actually. But... Uh, my whole point here is the longer you wait to try some of this stuff out, some of the stuff I'm recommending, the less your chances are going to be. It's just common sense.